thank you, Nan, for that great introduction. And I'd like to thank Nan and Dan and Cindy for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. And more importantly, thanking you for coming out on a cold winter night to listen to my program here. So with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. There are three seats up here. If you're brave enough to wade your way through the crowd, there are three seats. So um, first of all, how many, uh, how many people in the audience are a member of Dayton Hikers, my hiking club? All right, good turnout from the Dayton Hikers group. Love that, thanks for coming out. Appreciate your support. And how many people here have been to Arizona before? Lots of people have. Probably the same number of people if I were to ask Florida or whatever. So you might see some things uh, you're familiar with in this program. You might see some new things. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. So a little bit about Arizona. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It became a state in 1912, which was relatively late. It's our nation's 48th state. And it was the last contiguous state admitted to the Union, and the nickname of Arizona is the Grand Canyon State. How many people in here have been to the Grand Canyon before? All right, lots of you. It's the most popular destination in Arizona. And um, Arizona was once owned by Mexico, and Spanish or Arizona is Spanish for arid zone. That's one of the interpretations of where Arizona came from. And Arizona is 40% federally owned. So national monuments, national parks, national forests, that's a big chunk of land owned by the federal government. Compare that to Ohio with only about 1% of Ohio being federally owned. And in case you forgot what the United States looked like 200 years ago this year, that's what it looked like. So Mexico claimed a lot of our desert Southwest, including all of Arizona. So the Arizona Trail, this is a map. Um, it runs from south to north. It starts at the border of Mexico in Arizona, it goes all the way through the middle of the state northward and ends at the Utah state line. A little bit about the Arizona Trail, some facts. I'm gonna see if this will work here. The Arizona Trail is 800 miles long. Like I said, it goes from Mexico to Utah. It became a national scenic trail in 2009. It's a relatively new trail. To be a national scenic trail, you have to be authorized by Congress. It was completed in 2011. So if you haven't heard about the Arizona Trail, it's a relatively brand new trail. The highest elevation on the Arizona Trail is at 9,148 feet. And the lowest point obviously would be in the desert at 1,600 feet. It goes through four national forests, four national park units, and goes through 10 mountain ranges. I did not realize how mountainous Arizona was before I started out on that journey. So, and it also goes through wilderness areas and lots of deserts, the Sonoran Desert. So to talk about my journey, we have to talk a little bit about the snowfall during the winter of 2022 to 2023. I was not, I did not realize that Arizona got so much snow. And it, last winter was a big year for snowfall. Every part of the state got way more snow than normal. And that played a big role in my hike because it caused some damage in the Grand Canyon and trails were closed, trails were flooded. Uh, uh, mountains remained snowy long after they normally do. So um, the north rim of the Arizona, the north rim of the Grand Canyon got about 20 feet of snow. It normally gets about 12 feet of snow. So high, high snow year. A little bit about navigating the Arizona Trail. Uh, there are no painted blazes. If you've been on the Appalachian Trail, you know it's two by six inch blazes or the Buckeye Trail. So you can't paint blazes on cactus or you can't paint blazes on trees that aren't there. So, um, but they do have metal Arizona Trail logo signs. They do have trail junction signs. There is a smartphone app to navigate the trail that everybody uses these days, the Far Out app. There is a paper guide book that I left at home and I did bring the maps with me, but I quickly threw them away because they were not gonna be of much use in the field. And I used a smartphone app the whole time. So that picture on the left, that's one of the Arizona Trail logo um, signs that are out there. You see that, you know you're on the trail. And then when you get in the northern part of the state on the Colorado Plateau, they have Carsonite posts. And there are 257 gates to pass through on the Arizona Trail. Uh, they graze cattle in Arizona in the desert. I never would have thought about that, but cattle graze. And it's a free range state, okay? And free range, you're probably familiar with it. The cattle just get to go wherever they want, okay? Um, here in Ohio, if you're a, you raise cattle, you have to fence them in, okay? And if a cow gets out of your fence, it's your problem, okay? In Arizona, in a free range state, if you don't want cows in your yard, you have to put the fence up, okay? The cattle can go anywhere they want, and if you don't want them, you have to put the fence up, so. 
Uh, through hiking the Arizona Trail, um, if you're going to hike northbound, you do it February to May. You want to get to the desert before it gets hot, and you don't want to get up in the northern Arizona while there's still a lot of snow. They hike southbound um, in the fall and early winter. It's about a six to eight week journey. Mine took a little bit longer than that. Uh, there are very few developed campsites. It's just random, dispersed camping, and there are ample towns for resupply with friendly locals. Um, I began my hike on March 22nd. Um, I had some commitments and couldn't start until then, but it turned out to be to work in my favor because it was a high snow year, and the longer I waited, the more the snow melt and the less snow that I had to hike through. I started at the Mexican border. Um, about three weeks into my hike, I got the news that I was not going to be able to complete my hike because the North Kaibab Trail in the Grand Canyon was closed because of high snowfall caused rockfall and um, it really upset a lot of plans for Arizona through hikers. So I had to return a second time. So when you see pictures of me at Utah, hang on because I got a few more pictures after that. So I actually did finish the entire Arizona Trail on June 19th. It was 60 hiking days, 11 zero days or days off, 12 resupply boxes, and the temperature range went anywhere from 15 to 115 degrees. So you're preparing for winter and you're preparing for extreme summers. So this is the Colorado National Monument where the Arizona begins. The first thing you see are signs about illegal immigrants coming across the border. Um, it's a popular spot for people to come over from Mexico to get a ride somewhere else. Um, at the Coronado National Monument parking lot, the watchful eye of the Border Patrol with their cameras and everything is watching everything that's going on at the border. Uh, people that come across the border take the mountains deeper into Arizona. If they go through the desert, vehicles can drive there. They can be found a lot easier. They can be picked up a lot easier. So they take the hard way. They go with us Arizona Trail through hikers over the mountains, and that way the Border Patrol won't come after them through the mountains, through the snow. Uh, to get the journey started, you kind of have to get dropped off and walk south to the border, turn around and come back. This is the wall that's down there at Coronado National Monument. There is a gap in the wall for some environmental reasons. Some people had a, were able to prevent a portion of it from being put in. So the, the Arizona hikers kind of climbed through the barbed wire fence and posed next to the monument by going just a couple feet into Mexico. Then you make your way back to Montezuma Pass and you can see I'm two miles into the Arizona Trail and I'm up at 6,500 feet of elevation. I was watching too many cartoons as a kid thinking the desert was low, you know. So here I am day one at six and a half thousand feet headed to 9,000 feet. There's no spot east of the Mississippi that's 9,000 feet above sea level. You go into the wilderness, uh, this is in the Hawacha Mountains, and um, I ran into Josh uh, Horsefall, who holds the fastest known time for the Buckeye Trail right here in Ohio. He did the entire Buckeye Trail 38 days, 38 miles a day. And uh, he was doing the Arizona Trail too. I told him I'd never see him again because I was going to go slow and he was going to go fast. And, um, and I never did see him again. So um, getting up there on the mountain. You know, once again, my first full day on the trail, there was ice on the trees from freezing fog the night before. Um, this is late March down by the Mexico border. Some more uh, frozen fog on the signs. Um, actually had to walk through about a mile of snow, and I'm just five miles from Mexico in March um, in the springtime. And you do see a lot of empty water bottles and tin cans that the migrants and the smugglers have left behind. They discard that. You know they've come from Mexico because all the labels are in Spanish, not English. And we saw lots of clothes left behind and illegal campfires and different things. Uh, some Arizona trail hikers actually encounter the smugglers and the, and, the, and the people coming across the border. I did not see anything. So they generally keep the, they don't want anything to do with the hikers and uh, cause no problems at all. So this is the uh, Huachuca Mountains, snow covered. And up on the mountain where the trees grow, um, I saw some wild turkeys. And then I'm headed off the mountain range down into the rolling terrain of the Canelo Hills. And water sources on the Arizona Trail can be kind of sketchy. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of, 
cattle troughs and cattle business, so I knew I was going to have to drink some cattle trough water at some point. You cannot hike the Arizona Trail in its entirety with natural sources of water with springs. They just don't exist, unlike, say, the Appalachian Trail or Florida Trail, other trails. You're going to have to get help from cattle farmers, trail angels or whatever. And this was one of those things, do I want to drink water and live tonight? Or um, what, what, or do I want to go without water and see what happens? So believe it or not, though, the water filtered very clear and it was very tasty. That algae puts a lot of taste into the water. So it, <laughs> it wasn't so bad. <clears throat> And this is a campsite that I had um, in the Canelo Hills. And like I say, it's dispersed camping. This is not a campsite. This is just a flat spot to set up a tent. And I picked up water from that cattle trough, and this was my campsite for the night. This was my uh, first town stop in the town of Patagonia, Arizona. This is a hiker hostel called Terra Sol. There were a bunch of uh, Arizona Trail hikers and bike packers there, too. And we all went out to dinner one night at the Mexican place. So. Uh, back on the trail, uh, this is what's called a bike rollover. Because there are cattle everywhere and there's all these gates and fences, uh, this is kind of like a cattle gate where you've seen the bars where the cows won't walk across, but this is bicycle friendly. So the hikers and the bikers can go over here with minimal effort, but the cows won't cross through that gate because they can't see a place to put their feet on there. So you'll see a lot of these to accommodate the people that mountain bike the Arizona Trail. And this is what everybody called a UFO, but it's really a drop tank. This is an auxiliary um, fuel tank on a military aircraft that when they use it up, they just jettison the tank and it happened to land along the trail here. So um, it is, everybody just calls it the UFO, but it is a military drop tank. Everybody knows about this. This is prickly pear cactus, lots of cactus in the desert. This was another campsite I had in Temporal Canyon. Once again, just a flat spot. That's what you do on the Arizona Trail. And there's a picture of me at the campsite. During the day, it was hot, the sun was out, the temperature went up, uh, but at nighttime, there's uh, very little humidity in the air and that sun goes down, it cools off a lot. So here's another Arizona Trail uh, marker along the way saying that Utah is 731 miles. And I came across this little sign here. Arizona had a gold mining uh, period and um, the gold was in one place and the water to wash out the gold was in a different place. So they built this in um, 1902, they built this nine mile uh, long water pipe to get water from Bear Spring, which was always flowing from the mountains over to where the, the washes were that held the gold. And that way they could use that water to separate the sand and gravel from the, the gold flakes. So they built this elaborate tunnel. The Arizona Trail follows it, it's historic, and it ends up at a place called Kentucky Camp. And these are the water cannons that they use. So this gold was formed in the mountains. The mountains eroded away eons ago. All that sediment ended up in the valleys and they need to, just like you're panning for gold, they need to spray it and that heavier gold will sink and the sand and gravel will wash away. So it was never really quite a commercial success, um, but it was quite the endeavor to build this nine mile pipeline. Uh, this was the headquarters of the Kentucky camp. Today it's kind of like a museum. I camped on the front porch there. There's a caretaker there. There's like an Airbnb there. And then in the morning I went inside and had my morning coffee because it was a very cold morning. So Kentucky camp got its name by the Kentucky Gulch. And probably some miners from Kentucky in the late 1800s made their way to Arizona to do some gold mining because uh, they got called Kentucky Gulch. There's also a nearby gulch called Boston, Boston Gulch and Louisiana Gulch. So came across this sign through hiker ride stuff and this fellow um, along the road near the town of Vail just hands out food and snacks and creates shade for hikers. So we just come by and chit chat, get a chance to sit down, fill our water bottles, eat some food, fill up um, snacks that we need, and he does it all for free. So this is the 100 mile marker in the Santa Rita foothills. And uh, this is the, um, more of the Santa Rita foothills. Um, once again, heading my way towards the Sorita Red, Sorita Road trailhead. 
And there's a number of these boxes along the Arizona Trail, and you're like, hey, what's in this? You open it up, and it's water. So uh, the locals will drive out and refill these water jugs, and you can get there. You'd never know if there's going to be water there or not, but in this particular case, there was, and this was a great way to get water. Once again, you can't hike the Arizona Trail with natural sources of water. You need help. And it was always really nice to come across one of these and have some water. And I met up with Terry and Stacy from Ohio, and they're in the audience here. Terry and Stacy, raise your hand. They came out and hiked with me for five days, so that's them. And so um, we were headed north from the Soweto Road Trailhead, and this is where the Arizona Trail goes under I-10. And I-10 is a major east-west corridor. It goes through Florida, if you've driven through there. And um, this is um, this design is a snake mouth. So, and the snakes. It was a great place to take a break because there was shade. There's no shade in the desert. And the snakes take a break in there too. We didn't see any snakes in there, but it's called the snake tunnel because snakes will go in there to cool off too. So, um, and this is some desert hiking with the Rincon mountain range looming in the distance. And we were gonna go up and over that. Just a picture of me at the Pima County uh, park sign. And we're now getting into saguaro cactus territory. And saguaro cactus, that's a picture of Terry and me posing next to a, a cactus. Uh, so the saguaro is native to the Sonoran Desert, which is where we were. And the saguaro is the largest cactus in the United States, reaching heights of 70 feet. Okay, and they can weigh up to six tons. And saguaros can live 150 to 175 years. They live a long time. And the saguaro is the official state flower of Arizona. Go figure. The official state flower of Arizona. I had to double check that. So, and saguaros won't grow a flower until they're 35 years old. And they have a, they have a front side that faces south, and they have a north side. And a saguaro, if it ever has to be replanted, that front side that faces south has to be replanted facing south because that's how it grew and that's how it is. And they're very protected. And Arizonans, you know, they love their saguaros. Okay, just love them. So. This is a campsite that we had um, at La Sevilla picnic area. It really wasn't a camping area, but other people were camping there and we needed the place to camp and there was water, so we just kind of plopped down. And that's Terry setting up her, I'm sorry, Stacy setting up her campsite. And then we entered Saguaro National Park. Well, Saguaro uh, was a national monument before it became a national park. It became a national park in 1994, so some old signs are still there. And so, um, this is getting closer to the Rincon Mountains, walking through the Saguaros. We're going to be climbing out of the desert now. Um, we have about a 5,000 foot change in elevation over about 10 miles to get to the top of the mountain. And when you get to the top of the mountains, you see the mature trees, okay? Like you're down in the desert, it's scrubby, it's cactus, and you get to the top of the mountains and they're full of trees. And there's a, um, they're called sky islands, okay? And the trees grow on top of the mountains. Like here on the East Coast, when you get on top of a mountain, normally you don't find the trees there because the weather's too rough for them to grow. But it's cooler up there, there's more moisture up there, and it can support a woodland forest on top. So um, you go higher to get into the woods when you're hiking in these sky islands. Um, Arizona was once filled with woodlands, but when um, the environment started heating up 10 to 20,000 years ago, um, the trees couldn't survive down low, and they could only remain living higher up. So um, as you go higher and higher, um, you'll get more and more lush vegetation, more wildlife, more biodiversity on top of the mountains, and they're called sky islands. We made it to the top of Micah Mountain. This is Manning Camp at 8,000 feet. There's the Manning Camp Ranger Station. Um, and we hit snow on top of Micah Mountain. So we, were, we didn't have a lot of um, extra equipment with us to navigate the snow. And there's a picture of Terry at camp that night blowing up her air mattress. And there's a lunch break we had back down in the desert. Uh, you might remember that it was kind of a cold, windy day. Then we had our campsite near Italian Spring, and this was the coldest night that we had. It was 15 degrees, really, really cold. We did not want to get out of our sleeping bag in the morning. We had to wait for the sun to come up and warm things up. And this is the view from Shreve Saddle, and we're looking down into Sabino Canyon and Romero Pass in the distance and Mount Lemon that we were going to have to climb. 
So we had a campsite um, along Hutch's Pool. This is Terry setting up her tent, and this is where I set up my tent. It's really hard to put stakes in sand, so I learned the trick of using large rocks. There's a lot of rocks in Arizona, so I tied off my tent with rocks. And then we made our way up to the top of Mount Lemmon, um, which has, this is the Mount Lemmon Trail. It's got these hoodoo rocks that are volcanic in origin. And the work wasn't over after we climbed to the top. There was a lot of little ups and downs, ups and downs, so. And once again, back up into the Sky Islands, get on top of the mountains, and that's where the trees are. We finally made our way to the town of Summerhaven, which is on Mount Lemmon. And Mount Lemmon is home to the southernmost ski area in the United States. Terry and Stacy departed the trip and uh, went to go with Stacy's cousin. They visited the Grand Canyon. I got a little cabin that night because it was cold and I just needed a comfortable place to stay. Then the next day I started hiking in, uh, continuing my journey. And if you look out there, you can kind of see something uh, white off there in the distance. I'm on Oracle Ridge right now where there was a big campfire, a big uh, wildfire. And that's kind of a close-up of it. That's Biosphere 2, okay? Anybody remember Biosphere 2, that big experiment out in the desert where, um, I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a min minute. This is a horned toad. It's actually a, a horn, it's actually a lizard. And this is more hiking on Oracle Ridge. I'm crossing the 200 mile mark. It was a bittersweet day because it was Good Friday and the hikers all learned that the North Kaibab Trail in the Grand Canyon was closed. It shattered a lot of plans for Arizona through hikers. A lot of people just went home or they walked to Flagstaff or they got to the Grand Canyon and went home. They would not be able to make their journey to Utah. So this was another water tank that hikers were getting water out of. You had to climb to the top of it and dip water out of it. You didn't want to fall in there though because it was just the manhole cover. And I decided to camp there for the night. I like camping by water, so there was a flat spot behind there. And I had some Cheerios for dinner, actually. This is the Hijinks Ranch. And Hijinks Ranch was founded by Buffalo Bill Cody in 1902, who operated the gold mine here. And in 1987, uh, scenes from the movie Poker Alice were filmed here, starring Elizabeth Taylor and Tom Skerritt. Everybody might have heard Elizabeth Taylor. And that's what that sign says, Liz Taylor sat here. And the, the movie took place in the 1880s is what it was, and that's an old buckboard that they sat on. So, and some desert grasses on the way to Oracle. And I hitchhiked into Oracle and got picked up by these two lovely ladies. Imagine a grubby guy, you know, standing by the side of a road with his thumb out and two uh, nice ladies picking me up and giving me a ride to town. So I stayed at this bed and breakfast, the Melberg place. I double zeroed, I just took two days off and I went to go visit Biosphere 2. So I got a shuttle driver and I said, hey, let's go visit Biosphere 2. And so uh, this was that complex that I saw from the mountain ridge and it was constructed between 1987 and 1991. Biosphere 2 was originally meant to demonstrate the viability of a closed ecological system to support and maintain human life in outer space. They figured if, hey, if they could like grow everything they needed and live in here, then we could do that in outer space. So eight people entered Biosphere 2 for a two-year self-supported mission. They were supposed to grow everything and not need anything from the outside world. Well, it didn't quite work out that well, way. There was some group dynamics conflict. The group of eight split into two different groups that wouldn't talk to each other. One of the gal needed medical treatment, so she came out of Biosphere, and when she came back in, all of her pockets were loaded with snacks. And so there was a lot of cheating going on, and they eventually had to let oxygen inside too because they just couldn't get it right and they could only grow enough coffee to have coffee once every two weeks. So I would have been out of there. I don't know about you guys. So um, today it's owned by the University of Arizona and it can be rented for scientific experiments. So, and this was some of the living quarters in Biosphere 2. Once again, it was a two year mission. They were gonna be in there for two years. And they have different uh, biomes. There's seven different ones. This is the desert. Uh, this is the coral reef biome. And this was the rainforest biome. And when I went into there, I got hit with a wall of humidity. I have not been feeling humidity in Arizona. All of a sudden, bang, it's humid in here. So, uh, of course, it's a rainforest and there's a lot of water there. So, back on the Arizona Trail, Tiger Mine Trailhead, uh, I ran into a Gila monster. Okay, uh, these are li lizards. It's the largest lizard native to the U.S. and it grows up to two feet long. And it's one of the few venomous lizards in the whole world and the only one in the United States. And they don't have fangs. So. 
I did not realize he was venomous when I was taking pictures of him at the time. It was like <laughs> something I should have Googled ahead of time. But they're very docile. They don't like to bite. But when they do bite, they hang on. Like a snake might just bite you real quick and go away. These guys hang on, clamp down, and keep injecting venom in you. So, but he posed for a picture with me. And I only used a sun umbrella a couple days. It just wasn't my thing. I brought one with it. I mailed it home. But it was a way to bring your own shade. Didn't have to wear your hat. And you could walk along in the shade. A lot of people love it. It didn't work for me. This is the cane chola cactus. Um, this is the hedgehog cactus in bloom. Um, this was a rainbow at Beehive Well. So to get some of this water out of the ground for tanks, they used windmills in the old days, just like they did here in Ohio. It would turn a windmill, would turn a pump, and it would bring water out of the ground slowly and fill a trough for a tank. Today they're using solar-powered panels and electric motors. So, but I actually had rain that day, which felt really well, and I was able to get a rainbow over my campsite at Beehive Well and had a fantastic uh, sunset at Beehive Well. That was a view from my camp. So. Um, these are some desert flowers in the bloom. That orange is a mariposa lily. Um, these are the Black Hills of the Arizona Trail. All that snow meant snow melt, meant water, meant a super bloom for the flowers. The flowers just wait. They bloom every year, but when that snow comes in abundance and the water's in abundance, that's their time. Let's bloom. So, anybody want to guess what this is? Another UFO? This is actually a rainwater collector, okay? So rain falls and hits the roof of this thing. It's like a funnel. It goes on the inside into a tank, and then hikers can get water out of the tank. And so this prevents a 30-mile section with no water. So they built one of these things, and uh, when, during the monsoon, monsoon season of Arizona, it will fill up with water. So it also was a great place to get out of the sun and enjoy some shade. And if you're on the Arizona Trail with your horse, your horse can have water too. But it is fenced to keep the livestock out. And this was a long road walk um, through the desert. Once again, very, very little shade. And this was a, they call these tanks. We would call them a cow pond, okay? But this is an unnamed tank. It was about a quarter mile off the trail. I needed water. I walked to the edge of the water and I saw this bird. I go, it looks and sounds like a kill deer. And it sure is acting like it's got a broken wing and it sure is making a lot of racket. And I thought, I know what's going on here because we have killed deer here. And lo and behold, I was standing next to the mother's nest and she was putting on a show that, to distract me to get her away from the nest. So I got the water where I could and, and backed off. And it was a great place to camp. So I decided to set up my camp there that night. And that's a picture of me in the morning having some morning coffee. Once again, the mornings were cool. Started my day out with some coffee. And this is a jackrabbit, actually an antelope jackrabbit. And they feed on cactus, grasses, mesquite, and leaves. So really long ears and really long legs. And this was a cow skull that somebody put on a cactus. So just kind of <laughs> letting you know that you're out there all alone. And saguaro cactuses fall over the trail, just like trees fall over the trail here in Ohio. So somebody has to go out there and cut them and clear them and move them off the trail. And this is a, um, a barrel in Whips, uh, Ripsy Wash where water was just seeping out of the hillside. And in order to gather it, they put a barrel there. And it was really good, cold, clear water. So. And this was a trick you can do with your socks because there's so much dirt and sweat in your socks, you can make them stand up when you take them off. So when you take a break in the desert and you find some shade, you take your shoes off, you take your socks off, and your socks will actually stand up. So uh, probably it's time to get them, get them washed there. So these are some desert flowers in bloom um, in the Tortilla Mountains. More desert flowers. I'm hiking with a guy named Andy from Los Angeles and Red from Mexico, kind of hanging with them a little bit. And once again, more flowers in bloom in the Tortilla Mountains. We got into the town of Kearney, and the local IGA offers free coffee and a donut for all Arizona trail through hikers. Of course, we're going to go in and get a free coffee and donut and spend money at the deli and groceries and everything else. A so great marketing, but it's a great place to see all the hikers when they come in town. So. And all these folks in this picture are hikers. And you can see they're taking advantage of the deli food. And uh, Gary Lewis, Gary Lewis is back there. So raise your hand, Gary. He was another person that met up with me. He was in Phoenix for two weeks meeting friends and he came and plucked me off the trail out of Kearney and took me into Phoenix for a couple of nights. And 
he asked me what I wanted to do. I looked on TripAdvisor. Everything to do in Phoenix revolved around hiking. And I'm like, no, my day off, I'm not going to do it. So we went to the Desert Botanical Garden, <clears throat> which was lovely because all of these cactus and things that I've been seeing on my hike, there they all were in the Botanical Garden with name tags on them. So I learned a lot. He dropped me back off on the trail along the Gila River. And whenever somebody drops you back off on the trail, they're, you can tell they're kind of sad because they'd, they're not sure if you'll ever be seen again sometimes. You know? <laughs> and they really don't want to be the last person to like, yeah, he was fine until I dropped him off. You know? <laughs> so, but I stayed in touch with them, let them know. But Gary can probably attest to that, that like, hey, I'm dropping my buddy off in this really remote place. So, and this is a, a little marker. This is where the uh, Arizona Trail was completed in 2011. This is the canyon sections along the Gila River. And in this, you can look down below, you can see that green lush. That's a river, that's the Gila River. So water is life in the desert. You've heard that. It's n super apparent when you're hiking it. So where there's water, there's life. And that green lush area, this is the Gila River. Um, made my way down to it. This was the water that comes out of it. Chocolate milk water, a lot of sediment and silt. Ran through my filter and I drank it and it was just fine. And I decided to camp there down along the Gila River for the night. You kind of see my theme. If I get somewhere where there's water and a flat spot, I'm going to camp there because I hate carrying water up over mountains. So this is the lowest point on the Arizona Trail along the Gila River at 1,646 feet. That's still 200 feet higher than the highest point in Ohio. So it's, um, it's the lowest on the Arizona Trail, but it's still pretty high. <coughs> And these are some um, globe mallow in bloom. Once again, super bloom. They're just taking their chance. Um, I'm heading into the town of Superior, hitting the 300 mile mark. Um, and this is the Palo Verde tree. And this is something I learned at the Desert Botanical Garden. It had green bark. And I'm like, what tree has green bark? This is weird. There's something about it. Um, and Palo Verde is Spanish for green stick, okay? And the bark has chlorophyll and is used in photosynthesis. When you're a plant in the desert, leaves are not your friend because you can lose moisture through your leaves. So it has evolved to have green bark and it does the photosynthesis stuff through its bark. And it is the state tree of Arizona. So, little sign saying Utah is 500 miles. And this is a barrel cactus. It's also called a compass cactus. And it points towards the south. They grow and they point towards the south. That's kind of interesting, and the reason why is that the south side of the cactus gets a lot of sun, and the north side is shady. And the, north, the shady side grows quicker than the sunny side. So one side of the cactus is growing faster than the other, causing it to lean, causing it to point into the sun, which is why it's called a compass cactus. So when they get a certain age, they're all leaning, because once again, shade and moisture um, means life. So. These are some um, heading up to the Rivas Saddle um, campsite I had um, on the side of the mountain outside of Superior. I'm entering the Superstition Wilderness, and then when you get into the wilderness areas, it's uh, less traveled and less maintenance. And the Superstition Mountains, which you've probably heard of if you spend any time in Arizona, they actually get their name from the Native American tribe that lived there. Um, the Native Americans told stories about strange sounds coming from the mountains, people disappearing, mysterious deaths, and an ongoing fear of the mountains. So they had a superstition of the mountains. So uh, this is a flat grassy area near the Rivas Ranch and the Rivas Canyon area. White-tailed deer I came around. Um, and I'm descending into Roosevelt Lake on uh, forest fields. And once again, the flowers were in super bloom. Those yellows are brutal, bu uh, brutal bush. And you get to Roosevelt Lake Marina, and it's kind of like a little oasis because you're crossing a road. There's a marina there. There's a camp store. There's a little restaurant. And you pick up a resupply box there. So these are all the resupply boxes waiting on Arizona Trail hikers. Then you hang out by the hiker shack. And you open your box up. You hang out with other hikers. You buy beverages, food on the inside, and you just hang out with hikers, let your cell phone charge, and if you, there's a hiker box there, so if you have too much food, you leave it there. If you need some extra food, you pick it up. So, um, an important stop for people, and a lot of people quit here, because the going is really tough, and they have, they've had enough of the Arizona Trail by the time they hit Roosevelt Lake. So, um, once again, uh, more, more desert in the Super Bloom. 
Uh, looking back at Roosevelt Lake, starting a 10 mile climb. Uh, this is the Four Peaks mountain range with more cactus. And I got to um, Mills Ridge Trailhead and there was a cooler there. And in the cooler, um, there was beer and wine and water. And all the water was basically gone. The beer and wine was still left. So you can tell where the hiker priorities are. <clears throat> so beer and wine just kind of dry out. I wasn't in the mood for any beer and wine at that point, but they did have a little bit of water in there. So now I enter the Four Peaks Wilderness. The going is really tough, it's really rocky. And those are actually the Four Peaks. If you look at that close enough, you can count Four Peaks. When you head down the Four Peaks, it's a real narrow trail. One little step off to the side, one little stumble, and you're tumbling down the mountain. So. And when I got down, I, I camped in a wash. I was looking for a flat place. And you would not camp here in a rainstorm, okay, because raging water would come down here. So I checked the forecast, no chance of rain. I thought, well, I'll, I'll chance it. But it was the only flat place I could find. So I did camp in the wash. Not advisable, but it worked. And then when I got into the town of Payson, I needed a new pair of shoes. So um, I had bought two identical pairs before I started the hike. I had sent an extra pair to my friend Carol, and I said, Carol, I'm going to call you at some point and say, send me new shoes. I don't know when, I don't know where, but uh, you're going to get the call. And so I did a few days earlier. I should have picked them up at Roosevelt Lake, but I had completely worn a hole in my shoe. I was feeling every rock that I was walking on. I was slipping and sliding, and I hit the 400-mile mark. And right at the 400 mile mark, I had a greeting party there. <laughs> and it was an Arizona black rattlesnake, so, uh, which are kind of hard to see. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little video here and the audio is just, it's not too good. Oops, let's see if we can get this to play. keeping his eye on me the whole time. <laughs> so I don't know how many hikers, you know, get to see um, a rattlesnake right at the um, <clears throat> 400 mile mark, but I consider that a real treat. So, oh, come on, there. <clears throat> All right, and then I just, there was an Arizona trail sign on the ground that I picked it up and posed with it. Now I'm entering the, the mozzies, okay, and, um, Nobody really knows how to pronounce this wilderness, so we just call it Mazis, Mazatazel or something like that. Um, and it was the last of the wildernesses that we were going to hit. And so <clears throat> and these are the Mazis. And then I ran across this snake, and I thought it was the Arizona coral snake, but it wasn't. It's a Sonoran Mountain King snake. It's got the red and the white and the bands, but it was not a coral snake, and there are coral snakes in Arizona. Then I saw this eroded limestone and it kind of reminded me of like skulls or something sinister or so, but it's, it's just limestone that's weathered. And there's a campsite that I had near B Tank and that was the sunset that I had at B Tank. And a picture of me looking out of my tent making a morning coffee actually, cause it's cold. And I hung out with hikers in the town of Pine, took a zero there and uh, they were picking up their resupply box and just seeing them around town. And then um, when you leave Pine, you're about finished with the Sonoran Desert and you're gonna climb up on the Colorado Plateau. And the elevation is pretty much gonna be 7,000 to 9,000 feet the whole way. And that's the Mogollon Rim off in the distance or the, Mogi, the Mogollon Rim, different pronunciations of it. And once you get up above it, it's forested, okay? And you're now in the Ponderosa Pines for pretty much the duration of the rest of your trip and you're out of the desert. And there was snow up there, still snow. And there were a ton of downed trees. All that snow from the winter <clears throat> knocked a lot of trees down. And before um, I left Pine, I was checking the Facebook page for Arizona True Hikers. And this guy says, hey, if you encounter any downed trees, let me know about them. <clears throat> and I wrote back to him and I said, well, which ones do you want to know about? And he goes, all of them. I said, okay, and at this point I'm kind of slowing down because I think I can still complete my journey if I slow down and wait for the Grand Canyon to open. So every down tree that I found, I took a picture of it, I got the longitude and latitude, I recorded the mile marker and I sent it to him. And I recorded 167 down trees. 
And he used that information that I emailed him and he built this map and he sent this map out to the Forest Service and he sent it out to the trail maintainers and it was very valuable because these trail maintainers knew they had downed trees. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know how many there were going to be. The snow had just melted above the rim and the roads had just dried out and the Forest Service has just started to open up these forest roads because the mud was gone and these guys could finally get in and now they have this detailed map. I was hiking through there anyway. I had the spare time. I was a trail maintainer on the Buckeye Trail. I know the value in knowing where the downed trees are. So I got some real nice feedback from some of the volunteers, you know, and the trail director said your waypoints and photos were key to clearing the deadfall. Uh, without them, it would have been a major challenge. And one of the trail maintainers said, hey, it's a real game changer to know where they were. That kept them from having to walk miles and miles on trails looking for downed trees. They knew the roads, they knew the access points, they could see what the, pick, what the tree was, they knew what tools to bring. And he said, with the map, I knew exactly where to go, keeping travel uh, to a minimum over those horrible roads. So, and then a lot of times I'm sending these reports and then three days later, I'm hearing back that these trees are now been cleared off the trail. So these are some hikers at uh, Blue Ridge Campground, the same ones that I saw in Pine. I'm now at the 500 mile mark and I did a resupply at the town of Mormon Lake. Mormon Lake is normally a dry lake. However, with all the snow melt this year, there was actually water in Mormon Lake. I picked up a resupply package and I follow the route um, of the Flagstaff Lumber Company. So it's just kind of nice and flat. Um, the railroad was built in 1923 to haul logs from the forest to sawmills and Flagstaff. And these are the San Francisco peaks in the Coconino National Forest. The highest point in Arizona is Mount Humphreys. It's one of these peaks, still snow there. This is where the trail goes under I-40, which is another major east-west corridor. Um, and it's outside of Flagstaff. And I went into Flagstaff and I popped out on the road and I came by Mary's Cafe. Does anybody know what Mary's Cafe is known for? Any movie buffs in here? In 1971, a cult classic movie, um, Two Lane Blacktop, filmed a scene at Mary's Cafe. And it starred James Taylor, the singer, and the drummer from the Beatles, Dennis Wilson, um, from the Beach Boys, not the Beatles. And it just was a show, it was a movie. They filmed a scene in this little restaurant, and they're still talking about it today. But I did not know that James Taylor had a film career. And that's in that photo, that's him sitting down at the booth on the left. That's James Taylor, a young James Taylor. And that was right about the time his first hit started coming out. So heading towards the San Francisco peaks, I'm now at the 600 mile mark, and I met these two lovely ladies who were out mountain biking. And they were very intrigued by seeing an Arizona trail through hiker. So I stopped and chatted with them and let them know what I was up to and asked for some trail information, but they were really nice and I asked for their photo. So I had more snow at the higher elevation in the San Francisco peaks. This is a Alpha Fia tank. Uh, once again, it's cow pond, cattle pond. This is the side trail that would lead to Arizona Snow Bowl that's on Humphreys Peak. So um, came real close to that. Aspen trees up there at the higher elevations, way different than the Sonoran Desert up on the Cumberland or the Colorado Plateau now. More moisture, cooler weather, more rain. Uh, this is the green, this is a uh, green collared lizard. The guy stayed there long enough for me to get his photo. But I descended back down in the desert for about a day and a half of hiking, and I really didn't like it. I was getting used to the trees, and I thought the desert was behind me, and it kind of scared me. So, because there weren't many hikers north of Flagstaff, the Grand Canyon was closed to hikers, and people were just going home. Um, this is some water. I'd sent my filter home, so I drank this water, as you see it. So, um, this is Babbitt Lake. I did put chemicals in it, but you know, it added taste to it, really. I mean, the algae. The brown sediment, it adds taste to it. So, and when you're making coffee, you can't even taste it. So um, this was uh, a campsite that I had at Babbitt Ranch, once again, all alone. It turned out to be my birthday and my lovely mother and stepfather who were in the audience, uh, raise your hand, mom and Jim there. They mailed me a birthday card at Flagstaff and it wasn't my birthday, but it was my mail stop. So I picked it up and carried it and opened up their card in the tent to celebrate my birthday. And it ended up being my longest mile day, 26 miles. Then I finally got some company. I met up with um, Nidra from Canada. Her trail name's Co-op. And I met up with Stephanie from Ohio. Her name is Geo because she was a geologist. And I knew she was on the trail. I knew her back from the first week, but we just never crossed paths. We were roughly the same age. We we're from Ohio. 
And I finally caught up with her and I said, hey, can I be your friends? Can I hike with you guys? And they're like, sure, you know, because it was a desolate stretch. So I had some company. <clears throat> These are what my feet look like, even though I'm wearing shoes and socks and gaiters, trail dust, desert dust get in there, a campsite that I had near Anderson Tank. Um, that's co-op and geo walking towards the Grand Canyon. And Tom Helbig tracked me down. He's not in the audience. Some of you guys know Tom Helbig. He spent uh, last winter in Mexico, and when he was driving home from Mexico, he stopped to look for me, and he found me, believe it or not. I was setting up camp with, uh, with the ladies, and I see his van driving down the road, and I said, I think I know that guy. That's Tom Foolery, you know. So he stopped, and he had fruit, and he had snacks, and he had beer, and so we had a great time together. He spent the night with us before he moved on. But it was another bittersweet day because they announced that the closure of the Grand Canyon was going to be extended to mid-June, okay? It was not, would not reopen as they thought, and that blew any plans that I had of finishing it, that journey. I had to go home and come back. Um, this is uh, walking into the Grand Canyon when you go on foot. Uh, there's no lines. You just walk right in. And this is Geo and me hitting the 700 mile mark. So uh, I had a couple resupply boxes waiting on me because I thought I was going to be able to hike the whole thing. So I picked up my food. Um, <clears throat> Geo had gotten a backcountry permit because her husband was coming out to hike with her. So I just tagged onto her backcountry permit. Uh, I would have been able to go to the bottom of the canyon anyway because I was going to go down to the bottom of the canyon, come back up, shuttle north around the closure, and continue. So. Um, so going down the North Kai or the South Kaibab trails where the Arizona trail goes. And if you've hiked in the canyon, you've seen these warning signs about dehydration and exhaustion. They show you the guy puking. To, that could be you if you're not, you know, prepared. And so I headed down into, I was uh, hiking ahead of Geo and co-op and her husband and everybody. So looking into the Grand Canyon, this is the trail below Ua Point. Um, this is a picture of me um, on the overlook below Cedar Ridge. This is the tip-off area, a little shelter there. Some of you have been there. Got to the bottom, that's the Colorado River. And there, there's a rafter on the Colorado River. They come down, they stop at uh, Phantom Ranch area too. Um, this is the Bright Angel Creek. Has anybody camped at uh, Bright Angel Campground or Phantom Ranch down there? This is normally a babbling brook that's clear that you sit in when you're during the heat of the day, but there's still so much snow melt coming down that that creek was rushing and raging. Um, Phantom Ranch is where people can stay in a cabin that ride a mule down or hike down. Uh, you've probably seen the Phantom Ranch dining hall before. It's kind of a legendary place it has been there. Our campsite that we had was campsite number 23. It's a great campsite. If you ever go down there, remember 23. And we were going to spend the night and head back up the Bright Angel Trail because we could not go on. If we would have gone on, this is what we would have encountered. This was the North Kaibab Trail. It was destroyed by rockfall from the snowpack. And if we would have gotten up to the North Rim, this is what we would have encountered. Now, this not exactly what I would have encountered because this was taken about a week ago. But a lot of the hikers that were going up alternate routes were walking a road. And then the forest, then the national park people made it illegal to walk on the road, okay? So they were just shutting down hikers right and left. Like, how are you gonna hike in the woods with that kind of snow? That is the road leading north out of the North Rim. So I had to go back up to the South Rim. I'm gonna shuttle around. So I'm making my way back up. This is, um, this is the, um, it used to be called Indian Gardens. It's now called um, Hava Supai Gardens. Kind of got renamed. Um, and this was a funny sign, like who would want toilet water, you know? <laughs> but I guess you drink algae water and cattle tank water, but yeah, I think they mean toilet, you know, comma water. So <laughs> remember your punctuation, so. And this is back at the top, and that's a picture of me back on it. So I went back to Mather Campground. They have a hiker-biker site. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm going to get shuttled around the closure, around the snow, and hike the last 50 miles that I, uh, that I could still do. And I'm sitting in Havasupai Lodge and had Wi-Fi, and I'm like, oh, I just got a Facebook message from Cheryl McHenry from Channel 7. I didn't even know she knew me, you know. <laughs> And she said, Andy, did you know about those two people from Ohio that died in Buckskin Gulch real near you? And she was stalking the Dayton Hikers Facebook page. So, um, and I'm, I didn't even know about it. So she's like, yeah, we'd like to talk to you on camera. Can you do a Zoom call with Brandon Lewis? 
And I go, my shuttle driver's leaving in two hours. I'll do a Zoom call, but it's got to happen in the next two hours. So I was in Havasupai Lodge with Wi-Fi and talked to a Channel 7 reporter. And I was, on the, I was on the news that night. Did anybody see that? Remember seeing that? A few people. Karen saw it, so my mom saw it. So <laughs> after the interview, I called Mom. I said, Mom, you're going to hear about a guy that died hiking in the Southwest. It's not me. I'm alive, okay? <laughs> But I'm going to be on the news tonight. So, but what had happened was one hiker from Kettering and one hiker from Westchester went into uh, Slot Canyon, Buckskin Gulch, and there was a rainstorm going on. And they, one guy's body was found 10 miles away, another guy's body was found 8 miles away. And they found a body, and two days later, the daughter called in and said, My dad's overdue. And they're like, put two and two together, and uh, they never should have been in Buckskin Gulch. That whole week that I was hiking, it rained on us. Uh, there were flash flood warnings every day. Uh, the monsoon season came early. They probably did not have an updated weather forecast. Those slot canyons can be tricky. It can rain far away, and you can be flooded instantly in a slot canyon. And this was a picture that his family member had given to um, Channel 7, that was on the Channel 7 news. And um, I, two people from Florida died in this exact same canyon in March, two months earlier. So beware if you go to Buckskin Gulch, Wire Pass Trailhead. So I'm going to jump north to that top blue line and keep hiking. So I ended up plopping down in an area, got shuttled around in a, in a burn area, and still snow up there, still having to hike through it. And I'm finally dropping down close to Utah, um, back into the desert. I get to the state line campground, and I get to the northern terminus of the um, Arizona Trail and pose for a picture. So not done yet, because I go home and come back here real quick. But to get out of there, I had to walk a mile and a half to Wire Pass Trailhead. And that's where those two fellows parked their car. And this is the sign they had to walk by to go to Buckskin Gulch. So um, just keep that in mind if you go. It was a tragic accident. It never should have happened. They probably only had a certain number of days. They had a permit to go in there for a certain day. Uh, <clears throat> they just weren't aware of the risks. So I hitchhiked 50 miles into the town of Kanab, ended up getting a ride in the back of a pickup truck, caught a bus in Kanab, was dropped off on the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> Worst experience ever, a guy with a backpack and a beard on the Las Vegas Strip, like some <laughs> down and out gambler that's bankrupt, you know, <laughs> looking homeless. I had to spend the night there on the Strip and got an airplane home. But wait, 17 days later, I go back after the Grand Canyon has reopened and my friend tag along, Karen Power, raise your hand, Karen. I talked her into going with me like, hey, Karen, you want to do it? It's going to be easy, you know. So that's how I talked Karen into doing things. And it was her first trip to the Grand Canyon and she went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon with me. So we got that same shuttle driver. We flip flopped up. There was 47 miles of Arizona Trail that I needed to do. In my heart, I had to do it. Lots of other hikers were skipping it. They were going home at the 700 mile mark or the 600 mile mark. I was not gonna stand up here and do a presentation with you in front of me and say, hey, I skipped 50 miles. So <clears throat> I went back and did it, made a second trip. And this is Karen um, <clears throat> in a long meadow. Um, you can see she's got this look on her face like, what did I get myself into? It was cold up there. We did have a really cool campsite. This was our view from our campsite. We weren't even in the national park yet. We did hit our share of snow. Uh, Karen's not real thrilled to be on the snow. Um, and then we entered the national, this is how you enter the national park from the north at the North Rim. This little gate there. This is the um, highest point on the Arizona Trail. There is a fire tower there. Uh, and, and at the base of the fire tower, the Arizona Trail goes by it. And that's the highest elevation at a little over 9,000 feet. And we got caught in a rainstorm, so Karen and I saw this handicapped port john in a parking lot nearby. It happened to be there, so we ran over there and waited out the rainstorm. Um, perfect, it was clean, it was dry. We both could sit down, we could take our packs in there. So, um, and then when we popped out of the port john we ran into a park ranger on a mountain bike. And I thought, this is weird, I've hiked in a lot of parks, you just never see park rangers on the trails, they're always in their car or whatever. And this is Emily Krupp, and we stopped and talked to her, that was her job to talk to Arizona trail hikers. 
And we told her we were going to go to the North Rim, take a day off, and then go to the bottom of the canyon. And she goes, hey, well, I'll probably see you again because I'm going to be patrolling the canyon in two days. And I was wondering, like, how is she going to ride her bike to the bottom of the canyon or whatever? So it didn't make sense to me, um, but we continued on. We got to the North Rim. We took our day off. This is the hiker-biker campsite at the North Rim. Best and cheapest campsite in the whole Grand Canyon National Park. But you have to walk in or come in on a bike. We had a grand view right from our campsite. We met um, Mary McKinley, who's a, an accomplished long distance hiker, uh, just by chance. Her trail name's Denali, last name's McKinley, so she goes by Denali. She lives in Florida. Karen and I first met her when she was doing the Buckeye Trail through Ohio. She stayed with Karen. And then when Karen and I were doing the Florida Trail several years later, we were on her turf and she came and helped us out. And so then we saw her again on the Arizona Trail. So that was the third National Scenic Trail that we had seen her on. So uh, just by pure coincidence, we're heading down into the canyon and we meet Ranger Emily again. Of course, she's not on her bicycle this time. She's patrolling on her foot, so things made sense. And I chatted with her and it turns out that her mom and dad live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I, she goes, yeah, I go back to Ohio every time around Christmas time. And I said, hey, when you come back to Ohio, would you like to give a program to my hiking club about being a ranger in a national park? And she's like, sure. Did anybody attend my program last month? Yeah, a few of you did. So <clears throat> Ranger Emily, one month ago today, had a full house over at the Franklin Library. And she had, gave a wonderful presentation about what it's like to be a park ranger. So I stayed in touch with her the whole time. The North Kaibab Trail was not fully reconstructed. There was a little treacherous part here. Karen made me go first, so. <laughs> but then I'm like, I get the pictures then too. So uh, you can see that they put a little cable in there. And if you would have slipped and fall, fell, it would have been quite far down. Uh, this was our campsite at Cottonwood Campground. I showed Karen my magic trick about socks. She was not impressed, you know. I'm like, look, Karen, you can make your stock stand up. So, nope, wasn't interested. So made it to the bottom of Phantom Ranch. Um, so I kind of connected the dots, connected the pieces. But uh, my Arizona trail through hike was complete, but we were at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We still had to get out of there. So uh, still had nine miles to go. So we hiked over the Silver Bridge, back up the Bright Angel Trail. And this was the view from the top. And when I got home, uh, my great friends of the Dayton hikers had a little party for me and had this Arizona Trail uh, cake made for me. And so <clears throat> this is my last slide. And uh, I'll just end with saying I've done a lot of trails. And the Trail Association usually gives you a certificate or a patch or a sticker. But the Arizona Trail is really cool. They give you a belt buckle. <laughs> When you complete their trail, you get a brass belt buckle. So I'm sporting my Arizona Trail belt buckle today. So that's the end of my program. <laughs> Do we have some time for questions? OK, a couple, yes. I have a comment. Yes, Back comment. To a biosphere 2. Biosphere 2, yes. Uh, it's hermetically sealed. There's no outside air getting in. That's correct. So when they poured the concrete, the concrete was curing too fast and sucked all the oxygen. That's what it was. They had, yeah, something was sucking the oxygen out. The oxygen levels in Biosphere 2 dropped too low to sustain the human life inside, so they had to let oxygen in. So, because, of the, uh, because of the concrete. I also heard it was some of the microbes in the soil, too, but yes. Another question? Yes. You referenced a lot of bikers along the way. They're not on the same trail the whole way. Do they have parallel trails or they cross? Yeah, so good question. I mentioned about the bike packers that do it. They, uh, when it's legal, they're on the same trail as hikers and they're passing us up. However, they're not, uh, bicyclists are not allowed in the wilderness areas. So they have established go around routes for the wilderness areas. But they're, um, they're carrying all their stuff. They're going to the same towns, but doing mostly the same route. <clears throat> Yes. In the Superstition Mountains, did you see any signs for the Lost Dutchman mine? No, I didn't, but I'm, um, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. So did, yeah. I see, did I see any signs for the Lost Dutchman mine? No, so. Yes. When you were filming that rattlesnake, were you zooming in on that, or were you actually... The rattlesnake, luckily my camera, uh, when I filmed that black rattlesnake, I could get kind of close to it. So um, I, I got real close. So... Um, 
We'll end it there. I one more question back there. How heavy was your pack, if you know it, and how often did you have to provision? So I did 12 different resupplies over 800 miles. So you can kind of do the math. Not, I didn't have to like five or six days. I did have a 107 mile carry out of Flagstaff. So that was my longest one. And my. It, but my pack was probably, with water and food, close to 35, but going into town, it was close to 25. Yep. And what? One, one more last question. What epic treks do you have planned for 2020? Yeah, you know, I don't know. So after I did that, I did the Camino de Santiago in the fall. So I'm just getting home from a 500-mile Spain trip. So I'm still formulating. I would say if uh, Dan and Nan invite me back next year, you'll know what trek I did this year. So. <laughs> With that, I'll end it there. So thank you very much. You're a great audience. So.